In the next few steps, we're going to have a closer look at the reporting of statistical analyses and results and examine a variety of different graphical and tabular formats authors use to report findings. We will use extracts from the four papers we've examined this week as our examples to pick up on common errors in the reporting of results and examples of good reporting practice. This first figure is what is commonly referred to as a consort flow diagram, as it is a figure which is required when reporting a randomised controlled trial according to the consort guidelines. It is used to provide a clear summary of the flow of participants through an RCT study. The conventional flow diagram follows participants through four stages, recruitment, randomisation, follow-up and analysis. There is a link to a template diagram below this video. This is the consort flow diagram for the RCT paper we studied at the beginning of the week, in which the effectiveness of a critical appraisal workshop for health practitioners was being tested. The authors have made a few changes to the template, but it still provides the necessary information for a reader to gain a clear picture of what happened to participants and what data were collected. In the recruitment stage, we can see that 1,305 health practitioners were invited to apply to take part in the RCT. Only 145, 11% responded to the invite, all of whom were enrolled into the study and randomised. We then see that 72 were randomised to the control group and 73 to the critical appraisal skills training group. As participants were stratified by occupation for randomisation, the distribution of occupation is very similar across the two arms. Of the 73 who were randomised to the workshop arm, we see that 52, 71% attended the workshop and 21 didn't. Of the 73 participants in the workshop arm, 44 returned the questionnaires at six months follow-up and 21 the critical appraisal assessment. In the waiting list control group, 61 and 43 returned the questionnaires and critical appraisal assessment respectively, approximately six months post-randomisation. Of the 72 participants in the waiting list control, 50% went on to do the workshop. So the consort flow diagram gives us a clear summary of the flow of participants and outcomes available for analysis. The first table in a results section is most commonly the summary statistics of baseline characteristics of the recruited sample. Here we see two examples of such tables, one from the critical appraisal workshop RCT paper on the left, the other from the cross-sectional survey of hazardous drinking in young adults. As the former study was a parallel group trial, the descriptive statistics are broken down by randomised group. The latter summarises the survey sample as a whole. Each table produces summary statistics for basic demographic variables, age, gender and other variables pertinent to the content of the study. Pertinent to the context of the study. You can see a few stylistic differences between the two tables and it is worth picking out examples of good practice in the layouts. In the Critical Appraisal Workshop RCT paper, we see that only categorical variables are reported, so frequencies and percentages are presented by randomised group. For age, the unit, i.e. years, is indicated. The sample size in each group is also indicated in the column total. In the other table, the unit for age is not reported. Age is summarised using mean and standard deviation as it was collected in its continuous form. The other study collected age in categorical form. The format in which the standard deviation is presented using the plus and minus sign is generally not recommended as the plus and minus sign is more commonly associated with reporting the standard error, a different summary statistic. This table only reports percentages for the categorical variables omitting the frequencies. The use of both the frequency and percentage is recommended. In this slide we see results of the primary analysis of the cohort study we considered which examined the association between dog ownership and cardiovascular disease outcomes. In the table, hazard ratios are reported for each cardiovascular disease outcome and an all-cause mortality composite outcome. Hazard ratios are calculated when the outcome is a time-to-event variable. A time-to-event variable is, as the name suggests, the length of time to some event happening. In this case, time to diagnosis with a specified cardiovascular disease or mortality. For some participants in the study, this outcome will not occur within the time period of the study, and so the fact they are disease-free up until that time is informative and the data is said to be censored at that point. 
Hazard ratios are interpreted as the chance of an event occurring in one group, in this case dog owners, divided by the chance of the event occurring in another group, non-dog owners. A hazard ratio of 1 indicates no association between dog ownership and cardiovascular disease outcomes. We can see in the table that with the hazard ratios all being less than 1, that it appears that dog ownership decreases the risk of these outcomes. In particular, the crude hazard ratios for cardiovascular disease, mortality and all-cause mortality indicate that the risk of these two outcomes occurring in dog owners is reduced by 32 and 28% respectively, i.e. 1 minus the hazard ratio expressed as a percentage. We can see that for just one outcome, that the 95% confidence interval for the crude hazard ratio includes 1 as a possible value. The second set of hazard ratios are calculated adjusted for a number of confounder variables. What is of interest here is that for all the outcomes, the estimated adjusted hazard ratios are closer to 1, with two of them now being just over 1, and four outcomes not showing a significant association of dog ownership with cardiovascular outcomes. This is a good example of how important it is that adjustment for confounding variables is done to produce unbiased estimates of the association of interest. In the figure, this time the hazard ratios for each outcome is split by household type, single or non-single. In this figure, the vertical line through the figure indicates a hazard ratio of 1, i.e. no association. For each outcome, two hazard ratios and the respective confidence intervals are reported. The hazard ratio indicated by the square marker with the line through it, extending to the limits of the confidence interval. The upper one is for non-single households, the lower for single person households. There is a clear difference between the hazard ratios for each outcome, indicating for all outcome that dog ownership reduces the risk of these outcomes considerably more in single person households. In fact, whereas in single person households dog ownership reduces the risk of all outcomes apart from hemorrhagic stroke, in multiple person households the association is only significant for the cardiovascular disease and all cause mortality outcomes. Is only significant for the cardiovascular disease and all cause mortality outcomes. One thing to note is that the figure legend does not mention whether these are crude or adjusted hazard ratios. It would be important to check in the main text of the paper which type they are, as we see in the table adjusting for confounders. As we saw in the table, adjusting for confounders makes a considerable difference to estimates. This figure, taken from the systematic review paper we examined, is a forest plot, and is the conventional approach to displaying the results of meta-analyses. At first glance, it looks similar to the figure we just saw in the previous slide, but there are important differences. In the forest plot, the effect size and confidence interval for each study, included in the meta-analysis, is represented by a square and a horizontal line extending to the limits of the confidence interval. A pooled estimate, that is the estimate calculated from more than one study, is represented by a diamond, the centre of the diamond representing the effect size. In this case, a standardised weighted mean difference, and the east and west points of the diamond extending to the limits of the confidence interval. For each study, the size of the square is proportional to the size of the study. So we can tell quickly that the Toel 1993 study is considerably larger than the Weingarten 1985 study. Relating to this, a pooled estimate of effect size, which is very precise, with a large sample size, will be represented by a narrow diamond, as opposed to the penultimate diamond on this figure, which is stretched, indicating imprecision in the effect size estimate. The figure reports estimates stratified by asthma severity to explore if educational interventions vary in their effectiveness dependent on the severity of asthma in its sample. This figure tells us that educational interventions are effective in young people in improving lung function with a standardised weighted mean difference of 0.5, generally considered a moderate effect size, with the 95% confidence interval from 0.25 to 0.75. The figure reports the results of two hypothesis tests. The first is the test for heterogeneity, which examines whether there is statistically significant heterogeneity between the four study estimates in this meta-analysis. The test is non-significant in this case, p equals 0.49. The second tests whether the pooled estimate is significantly different from zero, which in this case it is, p 
less than 0 0.0001. In our next step, we will look at more of the results from the papers we have studied and consider how we can determine if authors have used appropriate hypothesis tests or not.